Well, stepping back for a minute, the fall of Atlanta shifts the political calculus. Fremont withdraws his candidacy. As late as October, Lincoln, we have in the, uh, in the Lincoln papers a little, a little chart. Lincoln drew up a chart of the um, states that he was going to carry and the states that McClellan was going to carry. And Lincoln thought he was only going to win by six electoral votes. It was still very close. So in fact, at that, they actually, Congress actually admitted Nevada as a state in October 1864, or around that time, to get the three electoral votes of Nevada. Nevada, a very small population, but strongly Republican. They thought they might need those three electoral votes of Nevada to win the election. But in the end, of course, oh, and the, uh, the campaign was conducted in, by the Democrats in the most, um, the most uh, racist way, just like in 18, uh, here's the soldiers voting in camp. Here, this is a Democratic Party political lithograph that was widely used in 1864, the miscegenation ball. Miscegenation, you know, uh, the English, there are, we got a lot of people in our English department who study the etymology of words. There's the Oxford English Dictionary. You could trace words way back to the German, Anglo-Saxon, etc. Miscegenation is a word we know exactly when it began. It was invented in 1864 by two Democratic Party politicians to somehow suggest interracial sexual mingling. So here is a supposed ball taking place at a Republican Party gathering, the miscegenation ball, with it's basically white men dancing with black women or embracing them over here, kissing them. Here's one sitting on the lap of someone. They're all dancing. This is the Republican Party, the miscegenation ball. White men and black women dancing, cavorting. That's what's going to happen if Lincoln is reelected. Um, this is what they would call in the 20th century a sort of dirty trick, you know, of, of politics. Um, but anyway, Lincoln eventually won a resounding victory. He carried almost every state. Of course, the Confederate states are not voting, but he, in the end, he got 212 electoral votes to only 21 for McClellan. The only three states carried by McClellan were two border states, Kentucky and Delaware, and, always bringing up the rear, the state of New Jersey, <laughs> the, one, the one state that's not a slave state that, were, that voted for McClellan. Now, the previous Congress meets again in, for its second session, beginning December 1864, right after the election. And they have to deal with this 13th Amendment, a constitutional amendment to abolish slavery. Now, in a movie, you might get the impression that Lincoln originated the 13th Amendment. This is completely false. The 13th Amendment was, origin was first launched by abolitionists in early 1864, particularly female abolitionists. The Women's National Loyal League, headed by Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, launched a massive petition campaign to have Congress abolish slavery by constitutional amendment. Then Fremont, remember, Fremont's platform in May endorsed the 13th Amendment. At that point, Lincoln said, yeah, it's a pretty good idea. Lincoln was actually opposed to it at first, not because he, was, he thought the best way to abolish slavery was state by state. Each state should abolish slavery on its own. Slavery is created by state law. It should be abolished by state law. Um, also, getting a constitutional amendment through is not easy. Two-thirds of Congress, three-quarters of the states, not easy. The Senate ratified it in the spring of 1864, but it was defeated in the House. In January, it comes back to the House for another vote. That's what the movie is about. Lincoln, by this point, pushes for ratification. So do the radical Republicans. The movie gives you the impression the radicals didn't want to work with Lincoln on this. That's absurd. They had originated the idea. Ridiculous. Um, Lincoln pushes for it, not as a choice between 
abolition and the end of the war, but as a way of promoting the end of the war, showing that there's no hope of coming back with slavery intact. Was there corruption in the passage of the 13th Amendment? Yes. Secretary of State Seward, as the movie showed, mobilized a group of fairly unsavory characters to influence people. Did Lincoln wander around Washington at night knocking on the doors of congressmen? No, no, he didn't do that, folks. Forget it, he was home in bed. But um, <laughs> anyway, on January 31st, 1865, they managed to get their two-thirds of the House of Representatives to ratify the 13th Amendment. Thereby, it goes out to the states for ratification. Why did they need a 13th Amendment anyway? Well, first of all, as we've said, the Emancipation Proclamation did not apply to parts of the, to the border states. It did not apply to certain parts of the South. Legally speaking, the proclamation frees individuals. It did not abolish the laws of slavery. It declared people free. It did not abolish the system of slavery. The 13th Amendment does that. Here it is. Here's my constitution. I always carry with it. It's very short. I'm going to read you the 13th Amendment. Section 1. Neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as a punishment for crime, whereof the party shall have been duly convicted, shall exist within the United States. This is the first time the word slavery is introduced into the Constitution in the act of abolishing it. Section 2. Congress shall have the power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. Now, let me just, before we end, make a couple of points about that fairly simple language. First of all, slavery is abolished completely and with no exception. There, later on, we'll see there's a big legal issue of what they call state action, the 14th Amendment. But this has no state action provision. Nobody can own a slave in the United States. An individual cannot own a slave. A corporation cannot own a slave. A government cannot own a slave. A religious group cannot own a slave. Slavery is abolished both privately and publicly. It covers everything. There is no exception to the, the fact that nobody can own a slave anymore. The second clause, Congress shall be able to enforce it. Well, how? What does it mean to enforce the end of slavery? That depends on what you think slavery is. What is being abolished? That is not exactly explained in this. Is it Property in human beings, is that what it is? Or is it more than that? Is it a whole social order built on slavery? Is that, is that, is what, is that what's being abolished? Is it the racial inequality that is the result of slavery? Is that being abolished too? What is slavery and what is freedom? The, the, the 13th Amendment does not answer those questions. It puts them on the agenda. And these are the issues that will become crucial to the period of Reconstruction. So as we will see next time, Reconstruction is beginning even in the midst of the Civil War. The end of slavery answers one question, but it throws a whole host of other questions onto the national agenda, and we will deal with them.